Looking very briefly at vitamin D, vitamin D uh, meeting the RDA is an issue for everyone, but many studies suggest the risk is higher among vegans because we have fewer dietary sources. Most people don't make enough vitamin D from sunshine exposure. And people that live in the north, like I do, I live in Canada, we don't make vitamin D from sunshine between about October to March or April. So it's a long time to go without making vitamin D from sun. And our ability to produce vitamin D from sunshine depends on the latitude that we're at, the time of year, the time of day, the cloud cover, our age, our body weight, our skin color, our skin exposure, all of those things can make a big difference. Uh, the RDA for vitamin D is 400 IUs for, for infants zero to 12 months and 600 for everyone else from one to 70 years of age and 800 for those over 70 uh, uh, years of age. So food sources for, for everyone, um, you know, food sources are mushrooms that are grown in UV light, eggs, fish, liver, fortified foods like non-dairy and dairy milks and cereals. So you can see for, for people that are eating whole food, plant-based diets, they're not eating um, many, if any, fortified foods. There's not a lot of sources they need to rely on sunlight. If they don't get enough sunlight, then they need a supplement. Uh, so supplements, 400 IUs is recommended for all infants to age two. 600 is often suggested for children. 1,000 to 2,000 is often suggested for adults with higher intakes, possibly needed for seniors. Vitamin D3 raises serum levels to a little bit greater extent than D2 and maintains higher levels longer than D2. Plant-based D3, however, from lichen is widely available. So it's not an issue. Moving on to vitamin B12, vitamin B12, the RDA is close to one microgram for uh, young children. It's close to uh, uh, two for older children and for, for um, everyone 14 years of age and older, it's actually 2.4. And it's getting closer to three micrograms for during pregnancy and lactation, 2.6 and 2.8. Plant foods uh, actually come up short on B12. So B12 is an issue for plant eaters. Uh, plant foods are just not reliable sources unless they're fortified. Even foods that are commonly thought to be reliable sources like organic vegetables, seaweed, fermented foods and mushrooms should not at this point be relied on as sole sources of vitamin B12. Uh, and just, you know, to, to, to give you, uh, you know, a little bit of the reason why, um, you know, seaweed, for example, um, the, the B12 in seaweed, when the seaweed is dried, is often the active B12 is converted to inactive forms of B12. So it's not um, as usable in that, in that uh, respect. Fermented foods, well, it depends on how dirty the containers are, how much bacteria are in the containers when the foods are being fermented. Uh, mushrooms, again, are they grown on human manure or what are they grown on? You know, it, that will make a difference for their B12 content. And so at this point, these just are not consistent, reliable sources. Uh, vitamin B12 stores may last two to three years or more in adults. However, breastfed babies born to B12 deficient mothers can develop B12 deficiency within months or even weeks of birth in some cases causing irreversible brain damage. Uh, this is something that just simply should never happen. Uh, pregnant and lactating women need to make sure they have a reliable source and we need, we need to make sure we have reliable sources throughout life. Uh, deficiency symptoms include uh, megaloblastic anemia, which is um, you know um, all of the symptoms like weakness and fatigue and all of that. It can cause eventually nerve and brain damage, gastrointestinal disturbances, and elevated homocysteine, which can increase risk of cardiovascular disease. There is a higher risk for seniors. In developed countries, 6% of people 60 plus are B12 deficient. 
Uh, and this is, you know, very significant. This isn't just uh, vegans or vegetarians. This is everyone. B12 deficiency increases the risk of dementia and Alzheimer's. 10 to 30% of individuals over 30 have a diminished ability to cleave the B12 off the protein it's bound to in animal products due to lower gastric acid and reduced enzyme production. The Institute of Medicine actually recommends that everyone who's over 50 relies on supplements or fortified foods uh, for their B12 and not on animal products in their later years, 50 plus years. We don't wanna mess with B12. Vegans, vegetarians, and everyone 50 plus needs to ensure reliable sources daily to monitor B12 stat and to monitor B12 status. Um, so what are reliable sources? Well, certainly supplements are reliable sources. B12 fortified foods like non-dairy milks and animal products for those under 50 who are eating animal products, who are eating a sort of a predominantly plant-based diet. So how much should we be getting from supplements? Well, you can see the RDA here at a, you know, a couple micrograms a day. The recommended doses are five to 10 micrograms for toddlers, about 25 micrograms. This is a daily dose uh, for four to eight year olds. And then possibly 25 to 50 for, for nine to 13 year olds and, and around the 50 for adults, possibly 100 micrograms. For those 65 plus, many people are recommending 500 to 1000 micrograms a day. During pregnancy and lactation, 50 to 100 micrograms uh, is, is uh, adequate as well. If we're just dosing two or three times a week, we're looking at you know, about 1000 micrograms a day. Um, and and it's, this is not recommended for seniors actually. Um, it's recommended that they do daily B12. So what form is best, cyano versus methyl uh, and adenosyl cobalamin? Uh, and this is the great debate uh, among uh, many practitioners in the sort of plant-based world with some of our um, you know, very respected voices saying we need to rely on cyano uh, and, and others saying it should be methyl. And uh, cyano is the synthetic form of B12. It contains a molecule of cyanide. However, the amounts are less than what would be consumed in common foods like flax, fre fre uh, fresh apple juice, apricots, those kinds of things. Um, this is the most stable and least expensive form. So if we're looking at providing it, uh, you know, in foods or to the global population, that's not uh, as well off, cyanocobalamin makes a lot of sense. It's safe for most people, but there's a caution for people with inherited disorders of B12 metabolism, smokers and those with kidney disease. For those people, it's probably better to rely on, on methyl and adenosyl. These are the natural forms of B12. They are a little bit less stable, but they're better retained once they're absorbed. Some experts suggest because they're less stable that we aim for a thousand micrograms a day. Um, and some experts suggest taste, taking both methyl and adenosyl for best results. And, and so I think that makes sense because they have, you know, can be used slightly differently in the body. And, and that sort of would help to cover all your bases. I think you can do either, I, you know, lean towards the natural forms myself, uh, generally, uh, but I, I think that um, either can be can be quite suitable. Omega-3 fatty acids, is fish necessary in the diet? And the answer is no. Omega-3 fatty acids are present in plenty of other foods. They're present in land plants like chia flax and hemp seeds and walnuts and the ahi flour and the echium seed uh, oils, which, you know, aren't very common foods, so not going to be relied on. They're also present in greens, although greens are very low in fat, so you'd have to eat a lot to get enough. They're also present in sea plants, microalgae in the form of supplements and macroalgae, which only provides EPA. Uh, they're, pre they're present in eggs, which is only DHA, not EPA. So do vegetarians and vegans get enough omega-3s? Well, our intakes are, of ALA are generally similar to or higher than omnivores. Of EPA and DHA, 
Um, there, we generally have neg neg negligible intakes in vegans unless we take microalgae supplements. It's low in vegetarians with eggs providing, you know, moderate amounts. What about our status? Well, plasma levels of ALA are similar to that of omnivores. DHA and EPA, about 30% lower in lacto-ovo and about 40 to 70% lower in vegans. So what about conversion of ALA to EPA? Because technically ALA can be converted to EPA and DHA. But since vegans essentially, um, and since vegans essentially consume no, no EPA or DHA from the diet, they rely on endogenous conversion unless they're taking the supplements. In most humans, conversion is fairly inefficient, averaging about five to 8%. It is higher in young women. There was a study showing conversion to EPA um, and to DPA and DHA uh, being about 30% in young women because their bodies are prepared for pregnancy, of course. And, uh, but for men, it was, it was a lot lower. Uh, so there are four, I have four tips for optimizing omega-3 fatty acid status. Number one, be aware of factors that depress conversion of ALA to EPA and DHA. And the non-diet factors are genetics. Uh, you know, we can genetically have less capacity to convert. Gender, men tend to be less efficient than women. Age, uh, Infants, especially preterm infants, have less capacity to convert, and seniors have less capacity. Uh, smoking and uh, chronic diseases like diabetes, metabolic syndrome, and hypertension can impair conversion as well. And then we have a number of diet factors. The first being um, high intakes of omega 6 fatty acids. So, for eating a lot of omega 6, relative to omega-3, this can depress conversion up to probably 40 to 60%. Um, and, and this, you know, we'll talk about the solution to that, but it's pretty simple. Inadequate nutrition, insufficient protein, lack of vitamin and mineral cofactors like zinc, magnesium, niacin, pyridoxine, vitamin C, uh, trans fatty acids and alcohol, um, and very high fat diets actually can depress conversion as well. Uh, number two is to ensure sufficient alpha linolenic acid. And for, you know, if you look at the, the recommended intakes, uh, they, you know, range from 0.7 for toddlers to, you know, 1.6 for, for adult males and, and 0.7 in females to 1.1 in adults. Um, what I recommend is for people who are consuming no EPA and DHA, that we double those intakes to uh, 1.4. Uh, to 3.2 uh, grams uh, per, per day. Uh, and uh, so 1.4 during, during the, uh, the toddler years and 3.2 for adults and for teens. And for women, it would be um, uh, 2.2 grams uh, during adulthood per day and a little higher during pregnancy and lactation. Uh, plant sources of omega-3, well, we get about 2.6 uh, grams in um, an ounce of walnuts. We get about one in a tablespoon of chia seeds, one in a tablespoon of ground flax seeds. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, 2.5 in a tablespoon of chia seeds, 1.6 in a tablespoon of ground flax, one in a tablespoon of hemp seeds, and less than 0.1 in a cup of greens. So if we're aiming for you know, 2.2 to 3.2, we'd have to eat 20 or 30 cups of greens at least to get enough. Um, we'd need to eat two or three tablespoons of, of hemp seeds and, you know, just over a tablespoon of, of ground flax or a tablespoon of chia seeds or an ounce of walnuts. We want to moderate our intake of omega-6s if they're excessive. So increasing omega-3 fatty acids is the most important way to balance essential fatty acids. So we want to focus more on increasing the omega-3s than decreasing omega-6s. But in some cases, it can be helpful to moderate omega-6 intake, especially when intakes are very high. And we can do that just by, you know, if we're using oils in cooking, for example, not choosing omega-6 rich oils like safflower and grapeseed and sunflower and corn and soy and cottonseed and sesame oil. Instead, we would choose, you know, an avocado or an olive oil, for example. 
Um, and, and then, or we might use an omega-3 rich oil for salad like flax or hemp. Um, and we might, you know, just moderate our intake slightly of, of omega-6 rich whole foods, but I, that's something that you would definitely worry a lot less about, like pumpkin and sunflower and sesame seeds. And then you want to consider direct sources of long chain omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, who might benefit uh, from supplementation? Well, certainly those with increased needs like pregnant and breastfeeding women, those who may not convert efficiently like people with diabetes, metabolic syndrome, hypertension, people that have traditionally consumed a lot of fish, possibly seniors, possibly everyone, we don't know. Uh, and that's the reality is we're not sure uh, if, if everyone would benefit from it or if by providing it for children, they would convert less. I generally recommend that I think at this stage, based on what we know, it's a good idea to supplement with EPA and DHA. Probably, you know, two or 300 milligrams per day for adults, a little less uh, for children. So, and typical suggested intakes, as I mentioned, one, uh, 70 to 120 milligrams for children, two to 300 uh, for adults, three to 500 for pregnant and lactating women. People with a diagnosed deficiency may need more, like 800 to 1,000 milligrams per day. <music>